Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Min. Today, I'm gonna bring you a case that many have referred as the Chinese version of Breaking Bad. And when he got arrested and received interviews in the prison, you know the regulars, right? He was asked why he even started his crimes and etc. He answers as following, quoted, I don't sell drugs to people in China, only to people abroad. They once used opium to open the door of China, and I can use math to open their doors. How do I put this? He seems to be trying to influence public opinion with extreme and seemingly patriotic remarks. When it comes to crime history in China, there are some pretty nasty dudes out there. But this guy we are going to talk about. He's one of the kind on another level, is like freaking legend. The way he cooked math has a huge impact on a ton of industries and even changed the whole industry game. The situation totally messed up, say the chemical and pharmaceutical industries and even schools got hit hard. Nowadays, any industries that needs even a little hydrochloric acid has to be super careful. I didn't know you could use this hydrochloric acid to extract math before reading this case. Or maybe I did, but it's a long time since I watched The Breaking Bad, so I forgot about that. Maybe. Not too familiar with these chemicals. They said he's not only good with theories, but also especially skilled at producing them in bulk. The math he sold was super duper high quality. Moreover, when he was a fugitive, he planted trees and became a tree planting expert. This man came from a humble background and achieved brilliant success, although the path he took was not entirely ethical. And his ending in China shouldn't surprise you. Let's explore the story of his life as it unfolds over time. Before the founding of New China, his father was a small peddler selling tofu. When his first wife and his worker had an affair, he divorced her and let her go free. Later, his second wife was Liu Zhaohua's mother, a single mother with a daughter at the time they met. This woman gave birth to four children with him, and Liu Zhaohua was born in 1966 the youngest child in the family. And most of Liu Zhaohua's families were Buddhists. So when he was around nine, his mother had this illness that she couldn't even leave bed. Liu Zhaohua knelt in front of the Buddha, crying bitterly and praying for his mother's recovery. He was willing to be a vegetarian for three years in exchange for it. And it worked and he won a great reputation from the neighbors and villagers where they lived. And he was also a total star back in the elementary school. You know, his behavior was always on point and his grades were top notch. He even won a bunch of learning awards at the provincial level. That was quite something, you know, considering the education environment or quality they received in those remote areas, especially where he grew up with. But it all changed to the end of his elementary school. When he was 12, his father died in a car accident. Only a couple of years later, his mother died of grief as well. His whole world got ruined. Liu Zhanghua's teenage years must have been devastating, having lost both of his parents. Despite his excellent grades in his class, he chose to drop out of high school in his second year and joined the army. So, you know, by joining the army, his siblings didn't need to pay for his tuition fee and life anymore. It's of the burdens for basically everyone. But by the time he wanted to join the army, he was underage, so he lied about his age to get into the army. And it looked like back in the day, the ID system wasn't as strict as it is now. People could easily create fake IDs with wrong dates of birth or even other information. From this, you know, forged ID thing, we can tell that Liu Zhaohua was a bit of a rule breaker from the get-go. So this guy was pretty sharp, you know, the kind of person who always seems to have it easy, apart from the fact that he lost his parents in a young age. But they just know 
how to work the system and how to work a lot of things out. You know, these type of people that I bet many people have seen it. So Liu Zhaohua crushed it and got promoted from the armed police for the brigade to the armed police command school two years later. And I know I said he joined the army, but that army is a local army thing that in China, these local army training institutions are for armed police rather than the real army army. Does that make sense? I hope it is because that's how it works here. Anyway, he went from being a regular armed police to an armed police officer reserve, which was pretty big deal. As out of all the local recruits, he was the only one who got promoted. After spending three years in this command school, Liu Zhanghua finally got assigned to a police station in 1988 as a full-time commissioner. Therefore, he could be assigned to work in a police station. As this police station was located in Pingtang County, which just happened to be the closest place to Taiwan. So um, let's talk about the relationship between Taiwan and China. It's been up and down, you know. Like one minute they are getting along, the next minute they are not. And back then things were pretty wild with people smuggling back and forth. Lots of folks from China going to Taiwan and lots of folks from Taiwan going to China. Anyway, that's when Liu Zhaohua met these Taiwanese in 1988 in this tiny little yet crucial county called Pingtan. It's said that he was there to protect some really important guys came from Taiwan or let's just say for sure that he just happened to chat to many of them. So with one of them, you know, they were chatting when they accidentally started talking about a new type of chemical drug called the meth, which was really popular in Taiwan at the time. They went on talk about how Japanese soldiers during Second World War abused methamphetamine stimulants. Liu Zhaohua got some really interesting chemical knowledge from that discussion. You know, with this particular Taiwanese friend. Back then, meth wasn't a thing in China yet. Even though it was becoming more and more popular in Taiwan, the laws there didn't catch up right away either. It wasn't until the new century that the Taiwanese authorities finally listed meth as a controlled drug and started to cracking down on it. Fun fact, back in the 30s to 50s, amphetamine was known as the anorectic drug and the FDA actually approved it as a weight loss aid. But then in 1971, it got banned and listed as a controlled substance in the US. But it actually became super popular in Taiwan, Japan and other places as a weight loss drug way after that. I guess back then people weren't sharing information as much as they do now. So Liu Zhaohua, who used to be a total school nerd, was super smart and loved to hit the books, you know, as the Asian kid. He grabbed a few chemistry textbooks from Taiwan and read them like a boss. And check out this image. It's all about this chemical synthesis route using effulgent and acetic anhydride to produce the meth. Then it reacted with acrylic acid to form this acetate. This was like the OG way of making meth straight out of the textbooks. But it's obvious that the final product was pretty whack in terms of how it looked and how good it was. It was nothing compared to what is popular now, I guess. And Liu Zhaohua wanted to improve it and he did, which we will talk later in the story. But back then, when Liu Zhaohua produced 50 grams of this math from the chemical equation, you know, the image, he just gifted it um, to this Taiwanese friend of his. Well, he didn't make any money out of this. He just loved playing around the chemistry, you know, the nerdy thing that he did and he enjoyed. He was all about the knowledge and never thought it as a way to get rich. And the first time anyone got caught with math in China was back in 1991. But our guy, Liu Zhaohua, cooked it up first in 1988. Means he was likely the first person to synthesize math in China. Rayo Trailblazer. 
but he was all right, not breaking too much of a law yet. He was still work in the police station, though he was technically a soldier as well. He had to do all his army training, and often had to crash back at the training centers or、um, places for overnights. As you might have guessed, what kinds of person he was, he wasn't the type who enjoyed staying put or being micromanaged in the local army. He knew what he wanted, and he wanted freedom to pursue. A better lifestyle, but officers at that time weren't allowed to switch jobs until 15 years after they enlisted. So he got to think of a way to get rid of this local army thing. Remember when we said earlier that the guy was gaming the system? So just can't just quit whenever they feel like it, unless they've broken some law or rules. But let's be real. No one wants to go to jail, especially the army jail. So this deal, Liu Zhaohua had to find a way to balance things out. He had to commit a crime that would get him in trouble, but not in trouble enough to go to jail. So he cooked up this scheme, where he embezzled a merely measly one hundred forty point eleven fifteen yuan from public funds. He got a slap on the wrist once and a stern warning from his superiors, but he managed to avoid jail time. He pulled off his little stunt perfectly and was able to quit in 1989, way ahead of schedule. So Liu Zhaohua always presented himself as a good student and good person along the way, and everyone in the army understood that the embezzlement incident was just for him to resign early. Many, out of a mindset to retain talent, or Liu Zhaohua himself, used some unknown tricks. His first job after resigning from the army was to join the People's Court of Fu'an City as a bailiff. After resigning in 1989 to become a bailiff, he married his first wife in 1990. The efficiency and smoothness of his life was so far very pretty impressive. Liu Zhaohua was a total boss back in the armed police system, and he brought that fighting spirit with him when he became a bailiff. He could take on a bunch of regular folks all at once, no sweat. And on top of that, he was a smooth talker, who knew how to get his point across. It's no surprise that he quickly rose through the ranks at the People's Court of Fu'an City, earning a third merit award in just one year. But that wasn't enough for the high ups. They saw something special in Liu Zhaohua, and put him in charge of attracting new business and investments to the city. That was no easy task, though. China was still getting on its feet in the 1990s. The Fu'an city wasn't exactly a hub for business, so to get the ball rolling, the government had to look outside the country and start bringing in investors from Southeast Asia. China used to have all kinds of coupons: grain coupons, meat coupons, clothes coupons, and even TV coupons. In the 1980s, even if you had the cash, you couldn't buy these items without the right coupons. Things started to improve in the 90s, but that's when smuggling really took off in the coastal areas. Fu'an City, located in Fujian Province, was one of such places. It has numerous. Taiwanese businessmen who were meant to invest in the mainland, but instead, they were secretly involved in smuggling cars, electronics, and other items to make quick bucks. Liu Zhaohua was responsible for attracting investment and businesses. It was tough in the beginning because he didn't have the necessary connections, but once he got in on some corruption, he found out it was actually kind of fun. So in 1992, he teamed up with a Taiwanese businessman to start a plastic making company in this in his hometown. They had three factories and a sneaky three-story villa that cost over 700,000 yuan back then. And Liu Zhaohua was super picky about where to set up the company. On the outside, it looked like they just dealt with importing and processing plastic waste from other countries, but in secret. They were actually smuggling cars, boots, 
and who knows what else under the radar. The spot where they set up the company was perfect, cause it was right by the river, making it easy to bring stuff in and out, and even sneak away if he had to. So within only two years, Liu Zhuhua became filthy rich. He went ahead and bought three Toyota Crown 3.0 luxury cars, taking turns driving them to and from work. Oh yes, he didn't quit his government job when he owned it. Back in the 80s, the Chinese government was in charge of car imports, and they decided which brands and models to bring in. It wasn't until early 90s. That a regular car market was finally established in China. So, like everyone knew that this Toyota Crown was smuggled in, no one really cared. It was a norm back then to have smuggled cars. The Toyota Crown 3.0 was like the super fancy car that everyone recognized as a symbol of luxury and wealth. And the person driving it, total big shot vibes. Time passed, and Liu Zhaohua's job of getting money and business was done. By 1994, he was supposed to go back to work at the court, but he was already super rich. So why going back to being a boring bailiff and getting paid peanuts, right? He quit his job at the government at the court and was like, "I'm gonna focus on my own company and be the boss of smuggling." And of course, after years of grinding away. In the system, from the police station to the bailiff, Liu Zhaohua knows the police inside out. From chasing down bad guys to making sure they got to court, and even how they manage the equipment, he's got it all covered. But unfortunately, Manplan got lapsed. Previously, the Chinese government had been lenient towards smuggling cars. However, when Liu Zhaohua considered completely joining the trade. The authority began cracking down on smugglers along the coast, plus recycling foreign plastic waste, which was supposed to be his legit business, was also super duper regulated by state laws. All of a sudden, it looked like Liu Zhaohua's easy breezy lifestyle was done though. So this dude was going down a shady path, and then boom, one full on dark side. Remember that he had many Taiwanese friends. There was this guy who often talked about the history and techniques of math with him. Well, when our guy was at his lowest, that same dude came back into his life. Let's just say that he was no good for him. But this guy saw potential in our main guy today, and even though he only followed textbook method, he still managed to make fifty gram of ice. Can you imagine how much time he spent reading up on that stuff, though? I bet it was only a couple of days. Anyway, this toxic friend started selling the benefits of drug trafficking to our guy, just like Little Pink in the Breaking Bad. And our guy had already done some smuggling before, so he knew all the channels. While this toxic friend was painting a picture of all the money to be made in Japan and Taiwan, he kept buttering up our guy, telling him how smart and capable he was. While、well, obviously he ate it up, and before he knew it. He was deep into the drug trafficking business, and that saying we talked about earlier, yeah, that that's 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 what's going through his mind. But it looks like that friend of Liu Zhaohua's who bartered him didn't really think he could produce them. You know, the eyes. He just wanted to use Liu Zhaohua's connections, you know, in the smuggling business to smuggling the meth or drugs. Out of his mind, though. Bulk making math was a piece of cake for Liu Zhaohua. You know, the difficulty of cooking a small amount of math is hella different than bulk production. He whipped up some math with a Fedrin way back in 1988 without breaking a sweat. But a Fedrin got put on lockdown in China in the early 90s, which made it tough to use for making math. Plus, like we said earlier, math made from a Fedrin wasn't winning any beauty contests. It was all yellow and mucky looking, with low purity. A mud that's actually warning selling, clear and frosty. But don't worry, Liu Zhaohua got it. Being the smart cookie he was, he did a fur dream and instead used proper oven to make math in one step. It cost him almost four hundred grand in research expenses, but hey, it was worth it. 
But still, the new method didn't quite deliver a product that was easy on the eyes. Being the perfectionist he was, Liu Zhaohao was determined to make his math the best it could be. He kept working on it until it was absolutely top notch. Okay, so back in the ninety six, Liu Zhaohua found out about a super wise professor at Xi'an Jiao Tong University who knew a ton about chemical engineering and pharmaceuticals. It brought over a kilo of methamphetamine liquid to show the professor, acting like he wanted to make some weight loss drug with it. He asked the professor how to get really pretty crystals out of it. You know how amphetamine were briefly legally sold as diet pills in the U.S. before being pulled from the market shortly afterwards due to their highly addictive nature. However, as we mentioned earlier, without the internet information exchange. And updates were not as frequent. The seventy-year-old professor in the nineteen nineties obviously was not aware of this crucial legal change. And chatting with Liu Zhaohua was awesome for him, because he was really good at talking. And even though he hadn't started chemistry formally, he was basically a self-taught genius at it. I mean, who wouldn't love talking to a genius, especially in the academy? Right. The professor taught Liu Zhaohua everything he knew during their chat. But to be fair, methamphetamine sulfate is usually yellow, so it's pretty hard to turn it into clear white crystals. So the professor suggested, why not try using the hydrochloric acid instead of sulfate to get the crystals he wanted? I bet that was mind blowing for Liu Zhaohua. So he locked himself in his seven hundred grand villa. And started his own experiments. After doing a ton of research and experiments, Liu Zhaohua, a straight-up genius, figured out how to make some top-notch math without using ephedra. And the cops had a real tough time trying to figure out how he was doing it. So he decided to start cranking out more of the stuff and handed a killer to this sketchy buddy just to test the waters in Taiwan. And it turned out to be some high-end stuff that all the drug laws were fending for. So Liu Zhaohua got his little pinky, another eleven kilo, and he asked or requested his body to keep it out of the domestic market. He gave the rest of the batch of his brother-in-law to stash away. Now you might think, was this Liu Zhaohua really being a patriot when he said that? Now he just knew too well. How China's law enforcement worked. Homeboy knows the system inside out, so he knows that if he tries to sell his crystals within the country, it's gonna get busted for sure. Unfortunately, his little pinky wasn't so obedient, not loyal, and no amount of jetsing from Liu Zhaohua could stop this toxic friend from selling drugs to a domestic drug dealer in China. As expected, this toxic friend. Fell into the legal net during the arrest. Liu Zhaohua luckily left town earlier because he had to attend a funeral back in his somewhat remote countryside hometown village. So he didn't have to share the prison misery with this toxic friend. Of course, most people would at least hide or never show their face again if their underlings got arrested. But Liu Zhaohua wasn't only totally chill; even did something inexplicably crazy. On November nineteen ninety six, there was this trial in the Fuzhou City Court. It was the case of Chen, and he was the toxic friend of Liu Zhaohua's. Liu Zhaohua has been following this case super closely since his friends got arrested. So he went to the court and successfully obtained a seat in the public gallery for the court hearing. He was totally fearless and wanted to see how it goes. So he sat in the audience and listened to the trial, not leaving until he got all the juicy deeds. When Chen was arrested, Liu Zhaohua totally knew that he wouldn't reveal his names because he had something on him apparently. But near the end of the trial, when he heard that this toxic friend of his was gonna get executed, he knew he was in trouble. Chen changed his tongue in jail and ratted Liu Zhaohua out, which got him 
switched to a life imprisonment instead of the death penalty from his first sentence. Well, you know Liu Zhaohua wasn't that kind of person who would sit and wait for the cop to get him. As soon as he left the courtroom, he booked back to Fu An in the dead of night, and holed it up in his own villa to hatch his escape plan. He didn't care if the pigs were hot on his trail or not. And get this, the Deuce Villa had some secrets of its own. Remember how he picked a spot right by the river to build his crib and factory. Turns out there was a secret passage under his villa that led straight to the waterfront. And what waiting for him right there on the river was a sweet speedboat, fully filled and ready to go. So all he had to do was make a mad dash to the village's secret exit, hop in the speedboat, and it was smooth sailing from there on out. He could make it out to sea in just three minutes flat. Meanwhile, it would take the cops a good forty minutes to get to the villa by car. And you know what? Liu Zhaohua had his own people stationed along the way to keep tabs on the cops' movements. So by the time the fuss finally rolled up to his villa, he was long gone. But he didn't even end up using this particular escape plan. He disappeared before the cops could find the villa, totally leaving his family behind. His wife only found out after he was on the run that her sweet hubby was actually a criminal. And in March the ninety-seven, the Fujian Provincial Public Security Department officially put on an APB to catch Liu Zhaohua. Of course, our main guy here always plays against the odds. You'd think that fugitives would hide their identity and live in constant fear, but not Liu Zhaohua. Instead, his first stop after fleeing was a famous Zen temple in Fujian Province. Remember his upbringing in a Buddhist believer's family. His father's ashes were in that ancient temple founded in the Tang Dynasty. Liu Zhaohua enjoyed some vegetarian food. And worshipped Buddha for several days in the temple before heading south to Sanya in Hainan Province. You know the other fruit of this China、um, rooster map. There he lived a carefree life like God, simply no longer needing to make or sell drugs. He ate fancy food and drank some top shelf liquor every day, with some seafood every few days. During his free time, he was jolted by the sea and enjoying the sunset. Man just wanted to lift it up. So before he knew it, a whole year passed, and Liu Zhaohua transformed from this poster image to a chubby face. Anyone seeing these two would not connect them as the same person, would you? So during his time in Hainan, Liu Zhaohua even had a girlfriend, and when she got pregnant. He gave her some money to have the baby back in her hometown. You know, just get out. You know, just get out from here, from where he was. After that, he fled again. He probably spent most of the money he brought to Hainan to escape and had enough of the retirement life. Liu Zhaohua decided it was time to get back to the business. So he migrated once more, this time to Puning in Guangdong Province. And there's a reason why he chose to stop in Puning City. This place used to be a big deal in the drug world in China, because it was home for Chen Bingxi, one of the biggest drug laws in the country. I'll probably make a separate video about Chen Bingxi's story in detail in the future. Anyway, Chen Bingxi used to deal in heroin in the nineties, but heroin was becoming A sunset industry, like any company, unconventional drug laws also have to innovate and abandon old products to explore new worlds. In early 1998, Liu Zhaohua had a dinner meeting with Chen Bingxi. At the dinner, there were also self-proclaimed drug experts, a narcotics inspector, and a so-called university professor. But when Liu Zhaohua smiled and asked about the details about drug making in front of Chen Bingxi, the two so-called experts became speechless from talking nonstop. So Liu Zhaohua seized the opportunity to shine at the dinner table, immediately gaining Chen Bingxi's favor. After dispatching the bystanders, the two 
chatted in depth, and unsurprisingly hit it off, and decided to cooperate. Of course, at first, Liu Zhao still had to play his cards close, only giving Chen Pingxi's team a formula using this old trick, ephedra, to make drugs. But just using that formula allowed Chen Pingxi's team to make 500 kilograms of meth. Chen Pingxi was completely astonished. He decided to do more sincerely, and in doing so, he earned Liu Zhaohua's respect as well. So later, when the call up, Chen Pingxi was responsible for funding and choosing the location, while Liu Zhaohua was responsible for raw materials, equipment, procurement, and production. It was kind of like a CEO and CTO. They split the profits equally. Both were happy working together. While he was in Puning, Liu Zhaohua started dating a new girlfriend who was also from Fujian province, and he was so into her that he even bought her a flat. And that's something commitment. The two of them were so happy together that they went back to Fujian province to register their marriage. And God knows how he could get married twice. He must have used fake IDs on either case, and they're small. When Liu Zhaohua and his new wife took their wedding photos, it was so good looking that the photo studio owner actually hung them in a window as an advertisement. The photo studio owner didn't even realize that Liu Zhaohua was the wanted footage. Even over a year later, when they finally took down the poster, okay, so Liu Zhaohua's luck wasn't exactly on point. Just when he was starting to feel good about himself. The factory he partnered with Chen Bingxi ran into some major issues. Basically, there was an incident that caused the factory's waste to flow into the fish pond, and killed a bunch of fish. The local villagers were pretty upset about it and reported it to the government. When Chen Bingxi finally found out what was going on, it was too late to do anything about that. They had shut down the factory completely. So after taking it out, Chen Bingxi and Liu Zhaohua decided to start fresh and build a new factory somewhere else. Liu Zhaohua was totally over the south, so he suggested that why not go further to the north and build a factory in the north instead. Chemical and chemical engineering stuff usually goes through three stages: small trials. Medium trials and mass production. Liu Zhaohua's life just happened to follow these three stages as well. It was like a small child when he just in, you know, his hometown Fujian. Then it got medium in Puning, Guangdong province, and now he is in Yunchuan, Ningxia province, where it's a full on mass production. The drug making plant he opened with Chen Bingxi in Yunchuan was probably doing well because of their. You know, these experience happened in Puning City. This new factory they opened in Ningxia Province is not polluting the environment as much as other pharmaceutical plants, and it's way cheaper with higher production yield. The Ningxia factory was all about Liu Zhaohua's industrial production skills, which he developed through chemicals, synthesis, and continuous crystallization integration. He probably learned this from Chinese chemical engineer Hou Debang, but he put a lot of his own effort into making it work on a massive production scale. It wasn't all easy though. Liu Zhaohua got hit by some falling equipment during installation and adjustment, and fell three meters to the floor, bleeding like crazy with a gnarly scar above his right eyebrow. He was brought up in a Buddhist family. So he believed in omens and reincarnation. He didn't know exactly what would happen, but he probably knew he was going to have some bad luck. You know this weird feeling. So one day he decided to head back to the south and meet up with Chen Bingxi in Guangzhou City. Cooperating with Chen Bingxi had clearly put Liu Zhaohua back into the game, and he was even able to stay at the Presidential Hotel. In the Tianhe District, one of the most luxurious hotels in the at the time. During his stay there, the Guangzhou Narcotic Police busted a huge drug case involving 400 kilograms of heroin. Obviously, that was Chen Bingxi's stuff. 
His underlings were caught red-handed by the police, who had been waiting for a long time for this moment. Of course, for Liu Zhaohua, this wasn't the worst of it. It wasn't actually Chen Bingxi's partner in the heroin game. However, the police also found twelve point thirty-six tons of ice in the warehouse. The batch of goods actually came from Liu Zhaohua. It was clearly written on the warehouse receipt from the Guangdong police. Liu Zhaohua was no stranger, after all. He has been on the wanted list for so many years. So they decided to go to the luxurious hotel where Liu Zhaohua was staying to make the arrest. While、well, they caught nothing, though, luckily they had surveillance cameras in that hotel even back in 1999. Hence, the police got to see clearly how the Liu Zhaohua really slipped away from under their noses. As soon as Liu Zhaohua strolled into the hotel, he felt something was up. With all his years as a former cop. Spotting undercover agents with a piece of cake, but Liu Zhaohua didn't want to make it obvious, so he just hung out by the elevator with the agents. You know, standing right behind them, he even let the agents press the eighth floor button before he pressed down the seventh floor button, like it was, you know, one of the other day of a random stranger. When the elevator stopped on the seventh floor, Liu Zhaohua stepped out, like it was no big deal. The undercover agents never suspected a thing and headed straight to Liu Zhaohua's room on the eighth floor after the elevator doors closed, and they just saw him going away. Meanwhile, Liu Zhaohua checked to make sure the coast was clear before dashing to the stairwell. He knew the police all too well. He figured the undercover agents who caught him were just the beginning, and there were probably a ton of police checkpoints waiting to grab him. And he was right. But Liu Zhaohua broke through them like it was nothing on his bike, so he just rushed into a bike shop to get himself a bicycle. Hopped on his bike, taking it easy and blending in like the locals sightseeing on the small roads. It wasn't until he left Tianhe District that he finally ditched the bike and hopped in the taxi to make his getaway. So where could he go? By the end of 1999. Liu Zhaohua went through a lot of places before finally settling in Qingdao, Shandong Province. The reason for him to choose this particular city was precisely that he knew no one there, and obviously he also figured that the cops wouldn't be looking for him too hard in there. During his time there, Liu Zhaohua didn't bring anything except a ton of cash. He couldn't find another drug lord like Chen Bingxi. So he obviously couldn't keep making drugs in Qingdao, but leaving off his stash of cash couldn't last. So what would this genius do? He opened a lottery stand. Since he had enough money to run a stand, he designed it differently from other stands and decorated it in a unique way. That's why many local business chose his stand as the venture for their lottery events. Even the local TV station in the world him as the famous lottery stand owner, and no one ever realized that he was a fugitive. Fate can be a real joke sometimes. Liu Zhaohua, who occasionally bought lottery tickets while operating the stand, um, but、um, he actually won a million prize. Even more unbelievable was that after taxes were taken out. He fully funded the marine biological department at the Ocean University of China, all because he was interested in the relevant topics about the extracting medicinal substances proposed by that department. Later on, Liu Zhaohua even participated in the university's research projects to a deep degree, like giving students lectures several times. It's got to be said that. Liu Zhaohua's relevant research expertise was legit, super professional. Do you all remember he didn't even finish his high school before joining the army? He never had a chance to properly study academic stuff. Oh, and this Ocean University of China is in Qingdao, where he at? But Liu Zhaohua, being him, he got enough of Qingdao pretty quickly for only a year or so. The deal was on the run, but still teaching and researching, which totally confused everyone, even the cops. At first, they thought 
He was trying to cook up some new drugs or something, but as it turned out, he was just being bored, and wanted to feel important by lecturing college students. But let's give credit where credit is due. Liu Zhaohua was a smart guy who knew how to put his knowledge into practice, like how he read up on chemistry and became a pro at making math. And now he's got a new hustle: pharmaceuticals. He figured out that you can get artemisinin and turn it into antether toxol comes from your trees, and vincristin can be extracted from flamingo and synthesized. And he's taking full advantage of China's policy to develop the western region and help out underdeveloped provinces. The deal got his eyes set on Guilin, Guangxi, and he's gonna make bank. You remember how we talk about Liu Zhaohua and how he started off doing investment promotion work in Fu'an. He knew the ins and outs of local government procedures like the back of his hand, and on top of that, he had some serious cash. So naturally, he became an important player in Guilin City's county government. Liu Zhaohua was a smart cookie. He knew what was up with the government and the system. And he realized that if he wanted to make it big in Guilin, he needed a more realistic fake identity. It was a bit of luck that he happened to run into a friend who could help him forge connections, and through some local officials, he was able to score a legit-looking ID card with a fake name. He went by Li Senqing, but with his real face, Liu Zhaohua, aka Li Senqing. Made a splash in Guilin by starting up a biotechnology company and investing in local projects. He even got interviewed by local TV stations and made a Guilin newspaper for being a good Samaritan. After he took on three thefts all by himself. So back in September 2001, Liu Zhaohua invested over 17 million yuan in a bunch of projects in Guilin. He was really into this one project where he got a use of thirty thousand mu of waste land of plant yu trees for seventy years, and this particular unit we use in China. Um, I'm gonna put the conversion on the corner somewhere on the video. And get this: these trees have the stuff called taxol that can be used to make anti-tumor drugs. This stuff is so expensive, like two point five million U.S. dollar per kilogram expensive. But even now, people are paying tens of thousands of yuan per injection for this drug. It's crazy. And since Liu Zhaohua is pretty good with chemicals, he can totally extract taxol from these trees and make bank. So while Liu Zhaohua was planting new trees in Guilin. He traveled all over Guangxi and even the whole China to collect specimens and seeds. He also visited tons of universities and research institutions. When he was in Guangzhou, he met the founders of a company that made atomized raw materials. They were all post PhDs in related fields. Liu Zhaohua had a great chat with them, and they talked about different chemical synthesis routes. You should know that at the time, every kilogram of this particular thing this company made sold for more than ten thousand yuan. So these pharmaceuticals were a lot more profitable than making drugs. It's worth mentioning that this company became the world's largest manufacturer of atether raw materials in 2020, and now they sell their products for only over three thousand yuan per kilogram. So let's go back to the planting thing. Liu Zhaohua invested seventy million yuan, right? He actually didn't have that much money. He had to seduce other investors and lure them to join his game. So this guy had a pretty simple yet effective strategy. First, he pretended to be the son of a Red Army official, which honestly wasn't that hard. Then, as the chemical genius dude. Liu Zhaohua, who was legit good at his work and had a real passion for it, 
So he would nonstop talking about his projects and everything in details,、uh, in these academic, you know, ways to present them professionally. His eyes even lit up when he talked about this stuff. The real trick, though, was the fake contracts. See, most investors didn't want to wait around for trees to grow. That's way too long time for them. So Liu Zhaohua made up a fake contract to export shallots to Japan and used that to trick people into investing. And he really went for it, convincing one big fish to invest six million yuan. That's more than the five million yuan he himself put it in the project. But it wasn't just this one fish. Lots of small investors were convinced too. The whole thing was supposed to be about planting new trees, but it all fell apart when Liu Zhaohua got caught. The Minister of Public Security put out a warning notice for him on TV and everywhere. Liu Zhaohua was chilling in a tea shop when he saw his face was on the screen. He even lost weight from all the stress over this planting thing. So when the shop owner looked at him weirdly, Liu Zhaohua was like. What's up? Do I look like a deal on the wanted poster or something? You know, with a big smile on his face. The shopkeeper was like, "Damn, it's not gonna be him." He got all red faced and tried to say it wasn't true, but it was hella awkward. Liu Zhaohua laughed about that and still chatting and eating until about half past six in the afternoon. He then left. So like when Liu Zhaohua's investors saw this wanted notice. He couldn't just wing in and talk his way out like that. He did in the tea shop. The investor who dumped six million yuan to him saw it on the TV and freaked out. Ended up calling the cops. When the cop came knocking on his door again, it was already long gone. Liu Zhaohua knew better than anyone what this A-level wanted notice meant, so he didn't waste any time and went into hiding. By this time, he couldn't go gallivanting. Off to another city like before. Instead, he had to hide out in the mountains and take his sweet time thinking things over. Lucky for him, he stumbled upon an abandoned Air Force radar station while looking for plant seeds. And just like the speedboat he had stashed away before, this spot was fully stocked with everything he needed to survive. And it was located in the deep woods. So he kicked there for a cold sixteen days. It was pretty boring. So the cave was covered and held a cool gravity by him. And when he couldn't take it anymore, he started thinking about what his next move was gonna be. After he escaped his hometown in Fu'an in the ninety six, Liu Zhaohua never had the guts to go back again. When he got the eight level notice in the late o four, it had already been nine years since he left home. Maybe those who leave home and travel around are always yearning to return to their hometown, to that chill and cozy vibe of their childhood. Liu Zhaohua was just like that, and maybe after dodging the law for so long, he knew he couldn't run anymore. China has changed a lot since the turn of the century, and forensic technology had advanced too. Plus, his old partner in crime, the drug lord. Chen Bingxi had been brought back to the country from overseas. Liu Zhaohua might have had a sense of his fate. Regardless, he just went back home, and he was arrested in Fu'an as expected. On the morning of the fifth of March, two thousand and five, a big squad of fifty-eight cops surrounded Liu Zhaohua's rental flat. They had all sorts of fancy gear. Like sniper rifles, infrared targeting devices, and night vision reconnaissance equipment, they burst in and caught Liu Zhaohua still snoozing. When they figured out they got the right guy, the cops were stoked. But Liu Zhaohua was super chill the whole time. It was kind of crazy how calm he was, and everyone was surprised. You could even see him sitting there with a grin on his face as the cops took him away. So, like after checking out these documents and getting to know the guy, it seems like he just waiting to get caught. When he was asked about what happened on the day of the arrestment, 
Liu Zhaohuan did say that he was planning to leave the country on the 6th or 7th. He got busted on the 5th, which is a total bummer for him. Okay, I'm going to spoil you that Liu Zhaohuan got a death sentence and it was carried out. But let me tell you, the trial was kind of wild. Anyways, I don't want to drag this out too long. If you are not up for hearing more about his outrageous stuff, just know that the deal was doomed from the start. So you might remember hearing about Chen Bingxi, drug lord from China. Well, that deal had a very public trial, but now we are talking about Liu Zhaohua, and it was supposed to be the same deal though. But last minute, they changed it and made it totally private. Apparently, they got a bunch of sketchy requests to attend the trial during the application process. So they had to put the kibosh on all attendants. I mean, it makes sense that a lot of media peeps would want in on this, since there's a lot of complicated stuff going on in Liu Zhaohua's case. Plus, big pharma and related research groups might be curious about it too, since it's all about drugs. But here's the kicker. They were getting requests from some real shady folks from Mexico, the US, and Japan. And there were six times more requests than the courtroom could have held. Like even for a notorious guy like Liu Zhaohua, that's super weird. So on the 26th of June 2006, they decided to have a totally private trial for Liu Zhaohua's major drug case, citing super unique man manufacturing process. And nobody, not even family members, could come to the courtroom. And Liu Zhaohua was assigned a lawyer by the judicial authorities. But at first, he was all like, nah, I don't need no lawyer. I'm broke. My family's broke. So I'll just defend myself. But then he found out that he could get a lawyer for free. He was like, okay, why not sign me up? When the lawyer talked to him about the case, Liu Zhaohua was like, go for the no pleading, not guilty. At first, his lawyer thought he was insane. Of course, being a dedicated lawyer after spending a considerable amount of time studying and brushing up on chemistry knowledge and reviewing rel relative materials from similar cases, the lawyer started to question his own sanity because he too believed in the possibility of pleading not guilty on behalf of Liu Zhaohua. Why? During the trial, Liu Zhaohua made a statement, statement claiming that the police had coerced and threatened him to use the term methamphetamine to describe the product he manufactured. However, in reality, the chemical he produced was totally an intermediate compound used as a routerized, not as a drug. Liu Zhaohua's defense strategy was based on exploiting legal loopholes at the time, which got patched up literally right after his trial. Moreover, by explaining his cooperation with drug lords like Chen Bingxi, Liu Zhaohua, like other drug traffickers, blamed others and pretended to be unaware of the true nature of the activities. Similarly, there was a segment during uh, Chen Bingxi's trial where he claimed that he was deceived by Liu Zhaohua and unknowingly involved in drug trafficking. Both individuals were passing the blame on each other. During Liu Zhaohua's trial, when it came to pharmaceutical production, he personally delivered lovely and interesting chemistry lessons, speaking at length with his trademark smile on his face, maintaining a relaxed and unhurried tone. Finally, his defense lawyer summed up the argument by stating, quoted, Drugs and pharmaceuticals often have dual attributes. When used appropriately for medical purpose, they served as medicines that elevate patients' suffering. On the other hand, when abused, they become drugs. Considering Liu Zhanghua's profound knowledge and expertise in the chemical substances, if he can utilize his expertise and contribute to anti-drug efforts and medical research that benefit society and humanity, wouldn't it be a good thing? Therefore, we earnestly request the court to show leniency 
and provide Liu Zhaohua with an opportunity to contribute to the anti-drug cause or pharmaceutical research in the future. But the cause seemed to be unmoved. On the 22nd of June 2007, Liu Zhaohua was sentenced to death in the first instance, but he did not accept the verdict and filed an appeal. However, on the 25th of June 2008, his appeal was rejected in the second instance, upholding the original sentence, and the case was submitted to the Supreme People's Court for final approval. On the 15th of September 2009, the death penalty was executed. Liu Zhaohua was executed by lethal injection, and before his execution, he was allowed to choose a background music. He chose the song, which I will link below and make a card to the corner as his final song. And it is a happy song, I can tell you. I don't really know what to comment about Liu Zhaohua's whole court thing. Like, based on what he said at the trial and stuff going on at the time. It seems kind of mm, iffy that he got convicted. And even if all the stuff happened after they changed the criminal laws, I still think it's worth questioning whether it was fair or not. But all of not something I should discuss here. Why don't we chat about Liu Zhaohua's Yu biz that got cut off. In 2020, Fujian Southern Pharmaceutical Company Limited released a semi-annual report with a revenue of over 65 million yuan, showing a growth of 22.7% compared to the previous year. Their main business focuses on the research, production, and sales of some anti-tumor materials and pharmaceutical intermediates. And of course, this company's success owes a lot to a farmer from Fujian who provided them with the yu trees and the raw material cultivated on his farm. Can you guess why this farmer started growing yu trees? Well, it's because he had been in jail when he was young. During his time behind bars, he befriended with a well-known inmate who often shared stories about his abandoned yu tree business due to being wanted by the authorities. And you know who that was. So why did Liu Zhaohua suddenly become the main subject of an A-level wanting notice in 2003? as he was okay for the past nine years. Well, it turned out that in early November of that year, Chen Bingxi was brought back to China. And according to Chen Bingxi's statement, Liu Zhaohua was still in the country, hiding out somewhere. He hadn't fled abroad like some of the other drug traffickers. So at the end of the month, the police decided to issue the eight-level wanted notice for Liu Zhaohua. And here's my take on why Liu Zhaohua didn't book it out of China. He probably knew the ins and outs of the system well enough to not realize that if he up and moved to a totally new place with a whole new family and social circle, it would serve as the same benefits as going abroad. No one would suspect him, especially they didn't have as many CCTVs in the past. It's just that after nine years of hiding, I guess even Liu Zhaohua became a bit of a stranger to the system. Hence why he only realized that he needed to go abroad but wanted to say goodbye to his hometown and got arrested there. So earlier, we talked about how the Guangdong police got their hands on this and 12.36 tons of ice from Cheng Bingxi's warehouse. Liu Zhaohua repeatedly emphasized in his confession that he actually cooked up 36 tons of that stuff. But since they only found 12.36 tons, that's what they based his sentence on. The thing is, nobody knows where the rest of it went. To track if he was telling the truth, the police consulted a bunch of camp experts to see if his factory could actually produce that much. Some people said it was possible, others said it wasn't. So there's still no official word on that. Why am I emphasizing the mention of the 12.36 tons or the 31 tons? 
It's because those two different numbers can actually reflect Liu Zhanghua's level of genius. If he truly produced thirty-one tons of drugs as he claimed, then his actual conversion rate exceeded an astonishing ninety percent. While there are some circumstantial evidence that seems to support Liu Zhanghua's statement, the authorities have not officially responded to these speculations. Therefore, in my video, I decided to leave this mystery unsolved. Liu Zhaohua said he could produce a lot of drugs with a crazy great conversion rate, but the other people start using his method to make drugs too. And from what we can see now, it doesn't seem like it. That's because his way of doing things was pretty complicated. He used some substances to make the math in just one step. But that's a tough process that needs a lot of fancy gear and smarts. Most drug dealers couldn't do that. Plus, Liu Zhanghua stopped making drugs after 1999. As we talked about before, he figured out that there was more money to be made in the pharmaceutical industry. During his years in Guilin, he dedicated himself to the cultivation of yew trees. Didn't have much time for drugs anyway. There's something that has been mentioned in many documentaries and stories, and that is the unclaimed suitcase in Liu Zhaohua's room when he stayed at the Guangzhou President Presidential Hotel. Remember that luxurious one? It said a certain potent substance known as the number seventh heroin. Its potency is claimed to be ten thousand times that of morphine, five hundred times that of heroin. And a hundred to a thousand times that of regular fentanyl. This substance has some connection to the Moscow theater hostage crisis in 2002. Chechen terrorists took approximately 800 hostage, and when the Russian special forces were preparing for an attack, they first used a secret chemical weapon to incapacitate everyone inside the theater. While they managed to eliminate thirty-nine terrorists, it tragically resulted in the suffocation and death of one hundred twenty-nine hostages. The secret chemical weapon was basically a spray made up of two drugs, the carfentanil, and another one called remifentanil, which is slightly less strong. The high number of casualties may have been due to improper dosage control. Or underestimation of its toxicity, coped with inadequate rescues. However, based on public available information and even interviews with Liu Zhaohua, he seems to hold a disdain for opiate drugs. It's interesting to discover that there might be a hierarchy or disdain among drug traffickers themselves. Considering Liu Zhaohua's dedication to research, it seems that producing that strong type of heroin. May not be a difficult task for him, so this really strong heroin thing was whipped up back in seventy four, and had been getting some use in medical clinics. That means there's already a ton of written information out there on how the magic happens. Compared to Liu Zhanghua's mysterious method of producing the math, it could be considered a piece of cake. At least that's how it appears from Liu Zhanghua's perspective. Although Liu Zhaohua is a notorious drug lord, he falls into the category of drug production. In his story, there aren't as many narratives about individuals suffering unfortunate consequences due to drug problems. This has led to a portrayal of him resembling a hero in many accounts. However, I don't want to depict him as a super genius or a heroic figure in my story because even though he may not directly harm people, he had produced substances that have caused great harm and devastation to many families. Although I have some reservations about the trial process and the issue of procedural justice, I think he definitely deserved the death penalty. In the future, I will cover cases or stories of individuals who have lived in great misery due to drug problems, and I know that microdosing seems to become popular over time. 
and people often do it with LSDs or mushrooms. But fingers crossed, not with the meth. Taking tiny doses of meth might sound okay, but it's super dangerous. As meth is widely considered an illegal drug with potential serious side effects and addictive properties, it can lead to heart problems even with tiny tiny dose. Central nerve system damage, behavioral issues, and mental health problems. So here's the thing: microdosing eyes might not get rid of those risks we talked about. And since there hasn't been a ton of scientific research about it yet, we really don't know what kind of long-term effects or safety concerns there might be with microdosing the eyes. Yes, I know there are people trying out all sorts of microdosing and recorded the process and posted online. What you know, these stuff are different for different people. Just be careful, right? Always consult your doctors. Personally, I don't get microdosing this thing at all. It could be that I don't need that much of inspiration in general. But keep it safe, people. And so far, my script is over nine thousand words long, way too long for both you and me. So I'm gonna end the video here. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you if you like me or my dog.